calculative, Grand Masters. One of the least understood aspects of our beings and of life and of the spiritual path is will. People talk about it abstractly. Use your willpower. Very few people understand what will is or how it is that Yogananda once said, there's not a single thing that anyone does or has ever done that was not done by will. We're going to discuss this. Why? People want techniques. Always people want to come to me with techniques. There are so many techniques that are available. When we're done with this talk, you pick what you want. You pick what works for you. What is important are the following. And this is the order they're important in. One, intent. We're going to discuss what intent is because it's very, very deep. Intent and will. Without intent and will, you have any technique you want, it's going to do absolutely nothing. Do anything you want, it will do nothing. It requires intent and will. Spiritually, worldly, business, relationships, intent and will run everything till you reach a certain point, and I will discuss that in this talk, where they fall away. That's called surrender. But there is no growth without intent and will. So basically, before I discuss will, let's discuss intent. Intent is what exercises the will. You know, in mathematics, we, we talk about vectors, force vectors. We draw physics. We draw vectors of force. All right? There are two aspects of that vector. One is the direction, and the other is its power, the amount of force that's behind it. How big of a force is it, and what direction is it going in? That is the relationship between intent and will. Intent is the direction you are aiming at. And I don't want to make it sound romantic. You can aim at terrible directions as well as you can aim at wonderful directions. It is just saying that when you set your intent at something, you will focus your will to it. So you create a vector that is of a certain strength. It could be weak, it could be strong. And it is going in the direction of the intent. Will has no intent. Will is a force. It's a power. Your car doesn't care where it's going. It has the potential to go anywhere. You have the intent, and then the car goes that way because you're the driver. So before I go deeper into intent, let's touch will. It'll help you understand intent and how you use it. I want to break these apart. You use them all the time. You just don't realize it. It's so intuitive, natural. Master said, Yogananda said, there is no act that anyone does at any time that is not carried out through will. Oh, that's very powerful. What does that mean? You have a body. You know you do. You move it. You get it out of bed. Your arms move. Your finger moves. You sneeze. All kinds of things go on. All right? Sneeze was a new example. But you, you do a lot with your body. Every single thing that you do with your body requires the assertion of will. Your arm, if it is sitting on your leg, does not move by itself. Now, the reason I said sneezing may not be such a great example is there are reactive, strictly body functions, okay, that go on. Then you use your will to not sneeze, <laughs> okay? Or if you have neuropathy and your arm jumps a little bit, you, try, you, don't want, you try to hold it so it doesn't do that, right? So will's involved, but there are certainly functions. The wind doesn't require your will. If somehow there's nervousness in your hand, it doesn't require your will. All right? But for you to carry out an action, volition, purposely requires will, including the moving of your arm. We don't think like that. It's so natural. You did not just break physics when you did that. You know, physics says there's mass, and an object in a certain state, whether it be motion or at rest, will remain that way unless a force sufficient to offset, you know it, probably better than I do, you know, Newton's laws of motion, all right? In other words, it is not going to do anything by itself. It requires an assertion of energy in order for that arm to lift up. Your arm did not break the law of physics. There is weight here. It requires force to take that weight out of a static position and accelerate it and move it. Where did that come from? I didn't see a steam shovel come up. I didn't see an atomic energy. I didn't see coal being burned. I didn't see anything. And yet, the arm moved. It moved through the force of will. It moved through the power of will. You asserted your will 
And because you asserted your will, your muscles tensed. And you've learned to assert your will automatically. How hard is it for you to get out of bed in the morning? I know it's hard, but I didn't mean it that way, right? How hard is it for you physically to get your body out of bed in the morning? It's lying down, you got to get it out of bed, and it's standing up, all right? I dare you to program a robot to do that and wait till you see how long it takes you and how hard that is, all right? It took them a long time to get these robots to move like that. Every single cell, every muscle, this has to contract, that has to relax. Otherwise, you rip your muscles. Right? They're in opposites, right? This one contracts, that one relaxes. Otherwise, it can't move, can it? Right? If this one's going to contract, that one has to be elastic and go out. You need to be sending all of those messages to your muscles, physical, I mean, arms, legs, body, feet, toes, hands, all of them in the right order at the right strength to get that body out of bed. That is not an easy thing to do, but it's easy for you, isn't it? Okay? On a good day, anyways, all right? It's easy for you to get it out of bed. Why? Because you have carved pathways. You have learned, just like programming, you have learned how to do this. And with a minimal amount of will, you just go run that program. And you just assert that will, and your stored habitual patterns make it go like this. But you carved those patterns, you made those patterns, and you are making them. If your arms are jumping up and down by itself, right, you'd go to a doctor. You wouldn't accept that. It's supposed to do what you tell it to do. You don't think like that. Because it's so natural, you don't you know, pick up the glass. You don't think you told it to do it, but you did. Do you understand that? It did not do that by itself. <laughs> okay? You carried out all those functions. That is an example of volition and will. Okay? We don't think like that. We're so lost in our normal functions that we don't pay attention to ourselves. That is what Master Will Yogananda meant when he said every action you do is an example and an action of will. It requires that, period. If your mouth moves and you talk, it did not do it by itself. You asserted will for that to happen, all right? So it's kind of neat. So will is a power that you use to drive your body, right? Just like you drive your car, you drive your body. Where does will come from? That's the part, so far everyone would agree with me, you know, scientists, psychologists, no, yes, Yes, you, you, you assert your will. You use your will. You have intent and you have will, period. All right? There are patterns that are habitual, okay? But you can break them, can't you? You got a pattern of drinking. You got a pattern of smoking. You got a pattern of coffee. You got a pattern of sleeping too late. You got all kinds of patterns, don't you? You want to change them? Which one you don't believe you can change them? If you want to change them, all right? You will change them. Example, all right? Smoking. People come to me and say, I've tried to stop smoking, I can't. I've tried, I've tried, quit six times, I can't stop smoking. That is what we call a lie. You say, why? how do you know? Why is it a lie? Because this is what it takes for you to smoke. Are you ready? You hit a pack of cigarettes, you have to go find it. Then you have to open it up. Then you, it's packed, it's got 20 cigarettes, something like that, and then you got to get one out. It's really hard without breaking them, all right? You got to get one out, and then you actually have to put it in this little three-inch area in your mouth, not in your eye, not in your ear, all right, get it into your mouth. Then you have to take fire. Fire's dangerous, all right? And put it right up against your face. Oh, my God, all right? Scary if you get it wrong. And then you have to inhale. Those are the things you have to do in order to smoke. Just don't do one of those things, and you will stop smoking. Just don't do one of them, and you will never smoke again for the rest of your life. Now, how can you tell me? I understand that you may not be able to do something that you're not doing like pick up a mountain or drive a Ferrari, you would never a stick drive, you know how to do it, whatever it is. But if you're the one who's doing it, how can you tell me you cannot not do it? You're doing it, just don't do it. There. Now you're understanding will. All right? The truth of the matter is, you were asserting your will to do all those things I said in order to smoke. Didn't you? I told you you have to search your will to move your arms and do your thing and find the cigarettes and use your brain. You have to search your will because you had the intent of smoking. I'm talking right around intent and will, aren't I? Right? Your intent was, despite the fact that you said, I want to quit, you're a liar. <laughs> that is not your intent. Your intent is, I want to want to quit. That's very different than wanting to quit. I wish I wanted to quit. I should want to quit. I've been telling people I want to quit and I've been telling myself I want to quit, but I don't. So if your intent 
is to smoke. It doesn't matter what you're doing in between. What is the core? Buddhists say work at the core. The core of that individual is, I should stop smoking, but I don't want to stop smoking. Okay, how do I know? There's proof you did all these things in order to smoke. You went out of your way to assert your will, to find the cigarettes, to put it in your mouth, to light it, to inhale. They all required will, did they not? All right. In order to stop smoking, it is very simple. Stop asserting your will that way. Assert it another way. That's all. And so there's this work inside that if you say, I have the intent to stop smoking, Maybe it was your wife telling you, I'm leaving you. You know, this is not good for the kids and there's secondhand smoke and I really believe in this stuff and you stop or I'm out of here, right? And then you realize she means it and all of a sudden when you go to take that cigarette and your intent is to smoke, something comes up and says, well, I like my family a lot, right? (laughs) And it creates an intent that I better be serious about this. If you do not have that intent, it ain't happening. So so that's the core, the intent. If you have a drinking problem, some of you, unfortunately, have gone through that, all right, you may end up at AA. A lot of respect for AA, all right? They help a lot of people. One of the things that they tell you is if it is not your intent to stop drinking, you don't belong here. If it is your intent to stop drinking and you want to stop drinking, right? Not someday or whatever it is. If you want to, we will help you do that. But if you're saying, I'm not ready yet, then you're not ready yet because your intent is what's going to win. The core, but some people lie to themselves about the intent. I'm talking about the core of the intent. And that's what we're going to talk about because this is spirituality. Spirituality is deciding what is your intent because that is what is going to determine your entire life. It's not a game. There's a song Yogananda wrote called I Have Made the Pole Star of My Life. What is that? That's my intention. I turn my eyes up And I aimed at the highest place that I could even see at the time. And that was my intention. And all kinds of other stuff goes on that pulls the energy different ways. Now that I have my intention, I need will. Okay? So my intention is to not smoke. I really want to not smoke. But it seems as though there's this force making me smoke. (laughs) You know anything about that? Right? It must be the devil. Right? That's the classic good and evil. No, it's not the devil. It's habit. Master used to talk about two types of will. Conscious will and habit-formed will. There is consciously applied will. So we've been talking about. You understand that? I want to stop smoking. I'm right here. I'm applying my will consciously, right? The trouble is, for the last 15 years of my life, I've been developing a habit because I didn't apply my will. In fact, I used my will in order to keep it going. Well, that developed a habit. And nowadays we call them neuropathways, don't we? You carved neuropathways. Your impulses, your nerve impulses through the brain are patterned to go a given way. Does that mean you're born that way? Does it mean it has to be that way? Let's get this straight right away. Well, what about genetics? Will is stronger than genetics. The fact that you have a a, a gene that would lean toward gambling or lean toward addiction or lean toward drinking, I'm sorry. You know, yes, you will have a harder time because you have more of a tendency to do that. It's a tendency. That gene is not making you do it. Your will is stronger than that. Your will is the strongest force inside of you, period. So basically, you have carved neural pathways. That's what you're going to meant by habit-formed will. And it is going to try and go that way. So when you smell a cigarette, what happens? Ah. When you see a cigarette, ah. <laughs> All right? It's like anything that stimulates the energy to go down those pathways, it wants to continue its journey. If you don't assert will, it's going to go that way. In fact, it's going to draw your will to make you go out and do what it's saying to do. Have you ever had a situation where you didn't want to do something at least a little bit, or at least you knew you shouldn't, right? And there was this force inside of you, in spite of you, that was pulling you into it. That is habit-formed will. It's the way these habitual neural pathways are carved. You may change any one you want if your volition is strong enough, if your intention is strong enough, and if you are willing to assert the will to recarve the pattern. You carve it any way you want. You know, it's funny, <laughs> Yogananda's teachings. He, one of his teachings was a great enlightened master, right? Back in the 30s and 40s, right? One of his teachings was to his disciples, every day 
break a habit and create a new one. Wow, just for kicks. Just to develop the ability to do so. So basically, you have these habit-formed neural pathways, these habit-formed patterns, and they draw you into them. And I'm not talking about just physical addictions. They talk nowadays, the big thing people talk about, you have a story, many stories going on in your head, right? A story about who you are, and a story about where you came from, and a story about what you like. You got all kinds of stories in there, don't you? Those are neural pathways. Those are just at the mental level. They are little, they used to call them, um, Ramdas used to call them tape loops. All right? It just keeps playing the same stupid loop inside. Anytime somebody doesn't say hello to you or something doesn't happen, or you have a conversation, I used to struggle with, you have a conversation with somebody and you walk away. It doesn't stop. There's something inside that goes, you shouldn't have said that. Oh my God, you should have said, oh, you forgot to say this. I was so impressive. It would have been so. And it becomes an habitual, habitual thing. I'm telling you, there are people that I've said that to and said, mine doesn't do that. We're not all the same, just like we don't all have the same patterns, right? It is the neural pathways that got carved based upon our past experiences. That's why Skinner, a behavioralist, said, man is the sum of his learned experiences. That's not true. I am the self, the consciousness, watching the sum of my learned experiences. Aren't you? Right? You can see it. You can see the tendency for things to happen. You can make them not happen. Then you are not the sum of your learned experiences. But you are sitting on top of a horse, if you will, that has been carved and patterned based upon your past experiences. All right? That's what carves the neural pathways. That's what programs this stuff. Every single time that water runs down a little crease down a hill, every time it runs down there, the next time rain starts happening, more water is going to flow down that crease, isn't it? Because that's the path of least resistance. And eventually you have a little creek there. Now try to make the water go somewhere else. All the water goes down there. It is the exact same thing with your neural pathways, with your patterns. Once you let it go down there, even a couple of times, it's amazing, all right? A couple of times, then basically it forms a pattern and it starts to think that way and it starts to act that way. And it's just like sitting inside of a machine. That's how you have to look at it. It's not who you are. It's not who you are. These things are not who you are. They are things you watch. When you feel a tendency to do something and you feel it pulling on you, that's not you. You're the one it's pulling on. Let's get that straight. You do feel the struggle sometimes, don't you? All right? My favorite is you're, you're not getting along with somebody, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whatever the heck it is, a close relationship, right? You're not getting along. You're having little spats and so on. And you know there's some certain subjects that you just don't agree on and Anytime you go near there, it starts a little bit of a fight. Anybody know anything about that? And so you decide you don't want to do that. I really love the person, and I want to straighten this out, and I know if we keep doing this, it's going to carve a pattern and ruin a relationship. So I'm going to go in there, I'm going to sit down the night, and I'm not going to talk about that subject. <laughs> and one hour later, you're all yelling and screaming, all this crap's going on. <laughs> it's like, it like just pulled you. It's just like it wouldn't leave you alone. Everything that got said, it kept thinking to say that, to remind the person what they did before. All of a sudden, you don't have control of yourself. You end up doing and going places where you said you weren't going to go. What do you mean you said you weren't going to go? During a time of clarity, during a time when you were not influenced by these patterns, you were sitting behind them and you said, this is what I want to do. This is what will be clear. This will be better for everything. And we know a lot of times that there's stuff that we're doing or saying or acting or whatever it is that is not in harmony with the true intention of where we want to go. And so basically this dance, we've now created a dance between intention, will, and habitual will. And that becomes the whole dance in there, doesn't it? And people who really have it together have set their intention constructively during a time of clarity. They set their intention of, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to succeed at. This is what I want to aim at, right? And they work at it. What was that? I I don't know. Somebody told me that, that somebody wrote a book when they studied all these successful people. Was it the Million Hour Book or something like that? Anybody know anybody? How many hours? 10,000, all right. It, that, they, that these people spend 10,000 hours as an average addressing themselves, focusing themselves on where it is they wanted to go. And that this is where real successful people end up. Otherwise, it makes sense. Because otherwise, today my intention is this, tomorrow my intention is that, tomorrow my intention is that. You don't go anywhere. It's not that you're not good. It's not that you're not capable. But if you don't have your intention focused 
and then you put your will, your energy in a direction that starts to build a vector that goes there, right? People talk about the law of attraction. This is much stronger than that. This is where you should be working with, right? It's the law of focus. When you focus yourself, you're like an arrow that goes in that direction. If every time something happens, you look around and change direction, you're not going to go anywhere. That's why people have trouble with business, why they have trouble with relationships, why they have trouble with money. I want to save money. I see it's important. I want to save and for my future and for you know retirement and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to put this aside. That lasts three days. Then they see something they want. I mean, it's shocking. I don't remember what the numbers I shouldn't throw them out. But it's something like 80% of Americans do not have anywhere near what they will need for their retirement. But they all had good intentions, but they did not stay focused on them. The minute something came up, the new this or the boat or the car or this or that, all of a sudden that was more important because the, oh, this is so important. The pull of the present is more real than your ideals of the future because your ideals of the future are in the distance and your mind will say, I can do it later. And that's why people don't do well in their lives. I'm talking about how to have a successful life, right? It's beyond relationships or anything else. So you get to the point where you realize, let's just get back centered now that I got you all realizing I'm talking about you. You come back to realize what's your intention. That's where it starts. What's your intention? What do you want to do with your life? You were born, weren't you? You're going to die, aren't you? That's the level you need to be thinking to answer the question, what do you want to do with your life? It's not what do you want to do this year or five minutes or next year or anything like that, right? Not what will make you feel good. Not what, No, it's I was born and I'm going to die. I don't know where I came from. I don't know how the hell I got here, but here I am, okay? And I ain't going to stay, right? What do I want to do with this time in between? You see how it's bigger than marriage or not marriage or you know, engineer or a fireman, right? It's like, what do I want to do with this time in between? What is my intention of what I want to do with my life? Your life is a precious, precious thing. Your life does not belong to your parents. Your life does not belong to your spouse. Your life does not belong to your children, does it? It belongs to you. It is your life. And you need to step back constantly, not just once, because you're going to get pulled in to the momentary effects, right? And you'll lose direction. You need to step back on a regular basis and ask yourself, what do I want to do with my life? I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going to die. And there's going to be these moments in between, and a lot of them are very distracting. And I'll go nowhere if I get distracted by them. Where do I want to aim my ship? What is my pole star? Just because you aim your pole star doesn't mean winds don't come and blow you around a little bit. But you have a pole star. You have some place you're aiming for. Most people don't. It's just whatever seems like fun or not fun at the moment, that's what I'm going with. I'm just being blown around by the winds of the current moment. You won't go anywhere. Can you see why you won't go anywhere? Go and get into a ship and pick whatever pole star you want, a different one each night. And tell me where you're going to end up. (laughs) You're not going to end up anywhere. You're just going to go around circles or whatever it is. There's nothing going on there. And you won't feel right. At the moment, it feels like fun, right? Or you avoided something, but you won't feel any purpose, any intention. You won't feel any depth. You have to step back and say, this is the core intention. What is my intention of my life, right? And it's not that hard to answer. It's not like these questions of what's your career, who do you want to marry, or how many children do you want to have. It is a question that says, let's start at the simplest level. Sometimes it's good to just look at the extremes. What do I want to do with my life? Would you like to be miserable throughout your entire life? Oh, okay, well, we don't want to do that. Would you like to be happy and excited and enthused and inspired your entire life? That wasn't so hard, was it? Look at that. You already decided what you want to do. That's perfectly legitimate. It's perfectly legitimate to say, I want to enjoy the experience of my life. Well, okay, beyond this question of enjoying it, would you like to only deal with yourself? Or would you like to feel that you were of service while you were here and that you left something behind? If if nothing else, better people, people that were happier because they were part of your life. Doesn't have to be buildings. Would you like to have an impact as you pass through on your journey from birth to death? And what impact would you like to have? There, These are the big questions, aren't they? 
right? And you step back and you do that regularly. And then you remember, you put aside, that's part of your meditation time, your spiritual time. You put aside 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. I like that you meditate. It's wonderful. But I want part of it. Do you remember, this is a morning and evening back to basics. That's what I'm giving you a talk. I'm giving you a back to basics talk, aren't I? Back to basics. Here you are. Yes, I know you broke up with your boyfriend today. Yes, I know this happened. Yes, I know you lost your job. Oh, meaningless, meaningless in terms of this. Ripples in the sea, little winds that are blowing around. Do you want to stay at the little level or do you want to have a big level? Because I want you to have a big level. Because the only way that works is big. Because the truth is you're a very great being in there. And until you come in harmony with your greatness and are able to express what is deeper than these little, tiny little fish that are jumping around, one of the Yuktashor Yuran's guru said, the great one is a whale, not a minnow. The minnows jump around the little surface of the water, making all kinds of ripples. The whale swims underneath, makes no waves, totally centered, totally clear, going somewhere. So you set your intention. The funny part about it is that is not so hard. Like I threw something out to you, and I doubt few of you object, which is, I would like to enjoy my life. Let's start that way. I was given this phenomenal time between my birth and my death, free of charge. It doesn't cost any money. I would like to enjoy the journey. It's a beautiful planet. It's a beautiful place. There's all kinds of exciting things going on all the time. Challenging, exciting. You know, it doesn't be positive. They're exciting. Even challenging things are exciting. They make you better. They raise you. And so you're supposed to be enjoying every moment of your life. How do you like that? I want you. I like you. I want you to enjoy every moment. Not he, 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 not that kind of enjoy, right? Hey, people play sports. They're serious, aren't they? And they enjoy it, don't they? Right? Because it draws deep inside of you. You get greatness from your being. That is what life is. In the East, in the, in the Upanishads, they say life is God's leela. That's what it's called, leela. You know how leela is translated? Sport. Not dance. Not creation. Sport. It's God's sport. All right? You are playing a sport, are you not? And it's very challenging. And you're just complaining <laughs> all the time, all right? I want you to say that the meaning of my life, the purpose of my life, right, is to enjoy the experience, to be appreciative for the experience, to be grateful for the experience, and to fully embrace the experience, and to give my best to it and take my best from it and there. So that's starter is that you're embracing, enjoying, not complaining and resisting, right? You're participating in the process of life. And remember this when I talk about your experience. At any given moment, you're having an experience. Do you know how silly it is to say, I wish I was doing something else? Play a sport and have the, the opposite team run a play a certain way and then sit there and say, I wanted them to do a different play. That's the most irrelevant thing in the world, isn't it? <laughs> it's, you better be ready for what they're doing, or you ain't very good at this. Let's not, some of you guys don't play sports. Let's get down to what you do do. You're driving your car, and the road turns to the right. I want to go straight. I'd rather be going straight, right? No, there's no rather. If the road turns, you're supposed to participate in the whole thing, or it doesn't work out very well. You are having the experience you are having. Enjoy it. Participate in it. That's what be here now means. It means this is reality. You're not going to have a good life if you'd rather be doing something else, are you? Okay? So the first step in defining your intention is a very powerful intention, is I am going to enjoy every moment of my life. Okay? And then the next step, which will happen naturally, is you embellish a little bit and say, while I'm enjoying every moment of my life, why not be helping others? Why not be raising the moment, participating and make it a little bit better? That's all. Why not be a good sport, okay? And just sit there and give my best and enjoy it. And then also try to raise others so that the moments unfolding in front of me are better off because they did. I said, do you want to leave something behind? That is the highest thing you can leave behind. That's the highest life you can live is that every moment that passes before you is better off because it did. You dream all you want about saving the world, but you ain't doing it, <laughs> okay? You're getting frustrated because you can't or getting mad at the people that aren't. What you can do is interact with the moment in front of you, your, your children, your spouse, your boss, your coworker, the driver in front of you, whatever the heck it is. You're interacting with moments. Are you raising them? Are you raising them? Or are you pushing them down because they're not what you want or what you like and complaining and so on? 
If you get to the point where you have no motive in your life except that every moment that passes before you is better off because it did. It's that simple. I'm not defining what better off means. It may just be a smile. It may just be anything, all right? But it's make it better off, all right? This is the moment passing before you. The other moments are not passing before you. You ain't going to do squat with them except mess you up in your mind. This is the reality. Are you willing to come into the reality with passion, with love, with inspiration? Because that was your intention. Your intention was to embrace and enjoy and participate fully in a positive way with the moment. And then are you willing to raise it? Are you willing to raise it so it's better off because it passed before you? You cannot live a better life than that. That's every moment, the highest life you can live. So this could become, I'm not saying it has to be, you do your own, but this could become your intention. That's an underlying intention. Now the question is, excuse me, teacher, how do you do it? It sounds good. How do you do it? It is not going to happen by itself. If you sit there and say, I have the intention to stop smoking. I've been smoking for 20 years. I've decided to stop smoking. How are you going to do it? It's over. I decided. It's really funny. (laughs) All right? It ain't going to happen. Because you're ignoring habit form will. You're ignoring the patterns that got developed throughout lifetimes and this life and whatever it is. You've just developed all these patterns of how to think and how to act and what you like and what you don't like. Anybody got, you know what I mean when I say what you like and what you don't like or is that a foreign concept to you? You have developed likes and dislikes. They can't be real because the person next to you is the opposite from you. And you changed yesterday. What you liked yesterday you don't like anymore. They're just patterns in the mind. And they change. They change because a new pattern comes in and it reprograms that pattern. You like somebody, you tell everybody I like somebody, oh my God, they're my soulmate, it's perfect. Then somebody comes up and tells you something about them that they did 10 years ago. And all of a sudden, you're not so sure anymore, are you? And then the person who told you that comes up and says, not, just kidding. Now you like them again. What is that telling you? Your psyche is the sum of its learned experiences. So it had one more experience and all of a sudden your likes and dislikes change. So your likes and dislikes are fickle. But if you make the intention that I told you, let's just play with that intention. And my intention is to enjoy no more depression, no more downs, no more moods. I enjoy every moment of my life. How would you like to do that? <laughs> All right? I wake up in the morning. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Everything that happens, oh, my God, if it's, if it's in the direction I like to go, it's like a miracle. I'm all excited. If it's a direction that I'm concerned about, right? Oh, boy, I get to deal with this. I'm going to get better. Everything will happen. Oh, my God, this is the greatest challenge that could ever be. So you've reached that point, right, where that was your intention. And then your intention was to help others, to raise the moments. That all sounds good on paper. How do I do that? That's what people want to know. How do I do that? Because they say, Mickey, you don't understand. That's not how I am. That's not my natural state. Maybe it's yours, but it's not. It wasn't mine either, (laughs) right? You have to assert will. You have to assert will to do anything you want. I told you to pick up that glass of water requires you to assert will. Okay? And if somehow you've got so much self-consciousness that, oh my God, they'll see me pick up the water. Now you have to overcome that. Otherwise, it keeps you from picking up the water. There are opposing forces. They are habit-formed will. They're bad habits. Right? So these are habit-formed patterns of energy. Nobody's saying you don't have them. Nobody's saying they're not pulling you in a certain direction. Nobody's saying that if your thoughts were broadcast on Times Square, that you would freak out and be embarrassed. And people to see what your thoughts are. Every one of you. Yes, there are patterns. You didn't make them. They kind of happen naturally. And you didn't do anything about them. That I'll give you. Now you have decided to change these patterns. So it boils down to. I don't want to hear, but I like it this way. I don't care. But I never like this. I don't care. I've never been a morning person. I don't care. Right? Oh, I need 10 hours of sleep a day. I don't care. So basically, we understand there are patterns. There are ways of thinking. There are all kinds of stuff. Some people sit there and say, but I have a problem with anger. That's because you wanted to. No, you don't understand. I have all this anger. I know. I know all about it. The truth of the matter is, there are habit form patterns. And if you have a habit form pattern of anger, then the moment something happens that doesn't hit you right, the energy starts to expressing itself through anger. So don't judge it. I want to go behind it. I want to talk about how did it get this way and what do you do about it? Do you understand that? Some people lie through their teeth. We're seeing a lot of that nowadays, all right? It's 
There's a lie. I wasn't brought up that way. I, I, I don't think I could make my mouth do it. Or you just, you know, you're lying. You just say it anyways. All right. You see a lot of that nowadays, don't you? Okay. And so basically, these are patterns, psychological patterns, physiological patterns. And that's because they set their intention of protecting themselves. Somebody who just habitually lies, their intention is, I don't want to get in trouble. I want to protect myself. I have the right to protect myself at any cost. So all of a sudden, everything else is out the window. This explains everything. I want you to understand it. So you first understand you're not made a given way. It just got programmed because of your past experiences, your formative years, your this, your that, your whatever the heck you want to get into. I couldn't care less. The point is you got these patterns, don't you? Jealousy, anger, insecurity, throw all the names out, all right? It's just patterns inside. Now, if I set my intention higher than protecting myself, getting for myself, expressing myself, it's all a part of the way. I have bent up energies inside, so I say stupid things, right, or do stupid things. That's everybody's intention until they wake up. I need to feel good inside. That means I need to release energies that are pent up. I need to say things that are bothering me. I need to do things that will make things be the way I want. That look at the intention. The intention is I need to take care of me. I'm number one. Ooh, that's very different than what I said before for an intention, isn't it? Now, do you see why I'm talking about intention and will? I've only talked about intention so far. I didn't get to will. I can do this, all right? So if you set your intention where they set it, you can be nothing. You'll be like what you're seeing. You get to see a lot of it nowadays, don't you? (laughs) I hope it inspires you to ask the question. You're born and you're going to die. What do you want to do with your life? Manipulate people so you get a moment's joy or release some energy or say what you want to say or do whatever the heck it is? Or do you want to do something meaningful with your life? You raise the vector. I call it the vector of what angle you're going at. What's your angle of ascent? or descent, (laughs) right? You set it high. Okay, now we said we want to do that. Now, how do I do that? First, full disclosure, right? It's going to be difficult. You're going to have to have enough will and enough fortitude of intention to withstand the pull of the habit-formed energies. It is an internal thing that you decide to do, all right? And you sit there and say, but if I try and I set it, I tried to stop smoking, and the next thing I knew, I was smoking. All right. What do you do? It is just like anything else. You develop will by working with it. If you don't use the will, it becomes weak. If you use the will, over time, it becomes stronger. So you practice asserting your will. Not, I'm going to stop smoking. You have trouble with smoking. That's not exactly the place you assert your will to start with. That's why you'll fail three times, and you'll stop trying. You'll change your intention. Oh, I tried. I'm not meant to. And Plus, you know, I only have a certain time in my life and my death. I might as well enjoy it. I'm going to die anyways. That's how smokers talk. And it was rationalized. You weren't able to do it. You set your high intentions. And now you lower your intentions because you weren't able to carry out. And then you justify. It's called rationalization. You rationalize the intention to where you changed it. Does everybody understand? ever do it? Okay. What, here's how I would have you do it. First of all, you are capable of being whatever you want inside. You're capable. I told you, if you want to be happy all the time, if you want to feel inspired all the time, if you want to feel passionate about what you're doing all the time, can't wait to get up in the morning, can't wait to deal with the family or not family, you love being alone, it doesn't matter. Whatever the heck it is, you're enjoying every moment of it. That's what I want you to be. You want to be like that? You can be like that. Because it, there's no competition. You're the competition. And the only reason you can't be that way is you, because you have these patterns that are fighting with you, aren't they? Okay, so what do you do? You don't start with the big stuff. You start with the little stuff. You do little things to assert your will. You're driving behind somebody in a car, and they're driving 20 miles an hour below the speed limit, and you have this tendency to get upset don't you? You have a tendency to complain. You have a tendency to yell at them. They don't hear you. You have a tendency to talk to them. Come on, don't you? Look at the speedometer. Did you see? Look at the speed sign. Did you see the sign? They're not hearing you. You're wasting your energy. That's what you're doing with your will. You're wasting it on meaningless stuff. How often do you waste your energy on meaningless stuff? How about all the time? What is that going to get you? I'm asking you a question. What is the constructive benefit of sitting in your own car, making yourself neurotic, complaining about how the person in front of you is driving? None. You're just releasing pent-up energy. So you take that as an opportunity 
way bigger. It's called extrapolation. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to work with this so that I'm better about driving behind people that are slow. That's not why you do it. I'm going to work with this so I develop the muscle of my will. Here is a part of my being that is meaningless. The cost-benefit analysis is 100% cost, zero benefit. It gets me upset and it does nothing. So you decide to make it a game. You don't work with the fighting and the smoking and this and that. You will eventually, but you start with, I'm going to develop my will. I am not going to allow that garbage to go on inside of me. I'm going to play with the fact that this person's driving me crazy over the way they're driving. That act is so powerful. You have used the intention of raising yourself, and now you're asserting your will to do it. How do I do it? I told you, find whatever techniques you want. You want to use positive affirmation? Then sit there and say, God, this person in front of me, they're enjoying their drive. I can't even enjoy mine, but they're, I, they're my idol. They're my teacher. Look at them enjoying their drive. They're just singing a song or something happened in there, right? Whatever it is, just say something positive. Say something enjoyable. If you see that it's like a little old lady who can't even see with the steering wheel, say, that could be my grandmother. I don't want somebody sitting behind my grandmother giving her a hard time, sending all bad vibes. You stop that this minute. You do whatever you want, but don't do what it wants. You rise above it. You are to raise yourself with your consciousness. Do you see it? So you set your intention. That's your higher mind, your higher intention. And then when lower things start to happen, don't suppress them. Don't get mad at yourself. Those are bad patterns. Raise yourself. So positive affirmation is a nice way to do it. Positive thoughts, right? Another way to do it is, oh, look, I get to go slower. I can practice my pranayama. Just practice breathing. You can do so many things. Just don't do what it would have you do. And I'm telling you, it extrapolates out to where you have taken some of the energy from your lower self. That's what we call it, your lower self. You've taken some of the energy from your lower self and you brought it up. It's called transmutation of energy. You brought it up to your higher self. And I'm telling you, the next time you're driving behind a car like that, it will not be as strong and you'll be stronger. And the next time somebody says something you don't like and you start to feel some anger, you pull behind it the same way. What's the difference between somebody driving slow, somebody saying something you don't like? All of a sudden, they'll all look the same. There's higher self and there's lower self. And you defined higher self for now as this aspiration of this high thinking. It's the higher mind, right? That the high thinking you're looking to do, I want to enjoy my life. You can't enjoy your life if somebody who's driving below the speed limit can make you get unhappy or somebody says something you don't like, or somebody doesn't say something you do like, if you have all these things that get you upset, you can't very well meet your aspirations, can you? And notice you're doing it to yourself. So what spirituality is saying, if you're going to do something to yourself, aim yourself high and then lift yourself there. Don't come to me and say, Mickey, I'm not there. I know you're not there. It's called the spiritual path. So you constantly, constantly remember in the morning, remember in the evening, hey, don't get mad at yourself if you're not. If you're playing tennis and you miss a ball and you get all upset, you will not be a very good tennis player. If you miss a ball, say, great, hit it again, same place. Right? Be like that. Pick yourself up immediately. No judgment, no guilt, no nothing. You just pick yourself up and try again. You're going to be better the second time because you had the practice of the first time. So don't even judge yourself. I don't want you to judge yourself. I want you to feel good about yourself that you're trying. It's not a measure of success. You have no idea how high the star of success is. These masters got really high. So don't even dare talk to me. I'm not there yet. Now I know. <laughs> okay? You just basically set yourself high, and then well, the only thing you don't do is give up. You just don't. You sit there and say, every time I assert my conscious will in order to raise the patterns of my habitual will, more of my will becomes conscious. And it does. You become what's called a being of power. You will feel it. You will feel that they talk about working out core strength. This is your inner core strength. You will literally start to feel like a different person. You'll feel like you have this power, this strength. And people can say things and you see something move inside of you, but you don't get drawn down because you're strong in your center. Meditation helps with this. Mantra helps with this. All kinds of techniques help with this. But the truth of the matter, do them all you want, but don't set your intention or use your will. They mean nothing. We're going to deal with your lower self. That's a higher thing to do. You understand that? Transmute the lower energies up to you. Who's you? In there? High. You'll get higher and higher, so what you think is you now will go deeper, but you know who you are, and you know what those forces are pulling you down. That's why we call it lower self and higher self. 
higher self is your, your, your conscious will that has set higher aspirations for yourself. And you know you're not there, but okay, that's what, we're, that's what we're rowing for. That's what we're working on. And your lower self are these habitual energies. You've got lots of them. The psychological patterns that you developed over your life that pull you down into depression, pull you down into anger, pull you down into jealousy, pull you down into selfishness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when they show up, raise them. Don't get mad at them. You're just raising all the energies up. And where do you see what happens? Now, what will happen if you do this, then you're going to find out, I'm going to stop smoking. I want to change my diet. And it's easy. I've watched beings who have raised themselves very quickly. And it's like they change patterns in a day or two. Major patterns, right? And they're not bothering them anymore. You can become that being. You can become anything you want. And once you set your aspirations high and your lower self is no longer pulling you down, this major change takes place. There's an actual point where it takes place. So now I've understood uh, intention. Now I understood the assertion of will. How do you build your will? By asserting it. You assert it. You don't let it take your will away. Well, what if I'm I'm there right at the edge and it's wanting me to do it and I don't want to do it? Oh, I love it. That's the greatest place you want to be, right? But win right? You like to win? Win. Win that struggle. Don't fight. Don't get mad. Just, you'll reach a point where you look at that and you say, no. No. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Master used to say, regain your kingdom. You're the king. You're the only one in there. You're a high being. Regain your kingdom. Don't let these lower forces run you. And you'll get to a point where you've sat deep enough inside and you've transmuted enough of the energies to where it's an amazing thing that happens. Right now, your lower self is pulling you out toward all these things. It's not evil. It's trying to feel good. It's trying to be happy. It's trying to get the rush. It's trying to get away from trouble, right? Eventually, as you establish your seat deep inside and you're guiding the energies, even your lower self will try to take refuge in you. It will sit there and realize, wait a minute. Yeah, there's stuff outside, temporary. This thing inside behind me, you, is always high. It's always clear. It's like a steady force. And literally, your lower energies will want to go up. They will not want to go out anymore. And they literally change directions, right? They flow up. And now you start feeling these rushes of love, of joy, of overwhelming ecstasy, just pouring up. It used to feel angry. All the anger turned into that. (laughs) Don't be that bad, all right? Now, now comes surrender. Once that happens, there's no more picking volition. There's no more having to assert the will. What happens is that energy starts to overwhelm you. It starts to bring you up. You start realizing that energy is the only thing I ever wanted was the beautiful feeling of well-being, total well-being rush up inside of me. I want to fall into it. I don't want to be separate from it. That's that's Samadhi. Those are the great states where your consciousness ceases to be separate from this beautiful energy inside. Which sometimes you get close in intimate moments. You can melt into beauty, can't you? Right? The sunset catches you. Oh my God, it's like a spiritual experience. That's what this is. Constantly. It's spirit. It's Shakti. Chi flowing up. From then on, your entire path is to surrender and relax into that flow of energy. It will do everything else. And that energy goes up. It's your teacher. It's your everything. And you just keep letting go, letting go. And you get higher and higher. Every day of your life, you get higher, right? And now now you you don't have to do anything. The energy coming off of you raises everything around you. So this is how you use intention and will. You use your will. You use your will to support your intention. It's your warrior, right? It's your warrior. So, But it's a gradual process. Practice it and raise yourself until eventually you will realize I am in charge in here, and I ain't never going down again. How about you? There ain't nothing that ever bother me again for the rest of my life. I'm aimed up. I'm staying up. And if it dares to come and it looks like it's going to bother me, I welcome it to pieces because it means it needs to be transmuted, and I can't wait. Thank you for showing that part of myself to me. I thought I was done. I'm not even close. Come on, bring it on. That's how a great being lives. So, all right, work on these things. Enjoy your day.